Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sheikh Abdullah Salim Cultural Center series of talks with the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, also known as KISSER. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anuda Sharhan from the Education Department, and I will be the talk moderator this evening. Our guest for this evening is Dr. Hussein Juma, who is currently an Associate Research Scientist at the Energy and Buildings Research Center at KISSER. Dr. Hussein's current research interests include steam power plants, solar cooling, and energy from waste. He has been involved in many research activities at KISSER since joining in 1998, ranging from energy audit of governmental buildings and the improvement of air conditioning equipment system. And today, he will be talking to us about the use of renewable energy in Kuwait. It's a pleasure to have you, Dr. Hussain. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Al-Sharhan, for the introduction. And I'd like to thank also the Abdullah Salem uh, Cultural uh, Center for giving us researchers and scientists this opportunity to interact with the public and uh, talk about uh, our research activities and uh, greeting uh, to uh, the participant uh, uh, tonight. Okay, uh, today's talk uh, is not intended to be very scientific or complicated. I'll, uh, and uh, the title might be misleading a little bit because I won't concentrate on only projects, renewable energy projects in Kuwait, but I'll try to give an overview of uh, renewable energy technology that's uh, suited for Kuwait. And I will talk also add to it the, the projects that have been done in Kuwait in general uh, in, in different uh, fields of the renewable energy uh, field. Uh, let's go ahead and start, uh, and the, uh, usually a renewable energy, uh, uh, what can I say, a renewable energy uh, presentation cannot be conducted without starting uh, on a background and discussing the background like, or the current situation uh, in Kuwait, the status quo, let's say. So the, the outline is first the energy generation in Kuwait currently. Then I will talk about renewable energy resources in Kuwait and the technologies uh, involved. Also, I will uh, try to talk about alternative energy technologies, specifically two, two uh, technologies that can be suited for us in Kuwait. Then I'll talk about the future and the vision uh, that the country have drawn uh, the different institutes uh, together with the government uh, to be able to spread the use and installation of renewable energy in Kuwait. Finally, I'll have a few remarks and then I'll mention uh, the challenges that will, will, uh, we will face as a nation, as a country, uh, in trying to implement uh, renewable energy technologies in the country. First, let's talk about uh, the current situation. Kuwait current daily oil production ranges between 2.5 to 2.8 barrels per day, uh, give and take. We entirely rely on oil and gas fire technologies to generate electricity and desalinate uh, seawater. We don't have fresh water resources and our electricity is generated uh, using steam and uh, gas turbines. Usually we use oil uh, that's produced locally in Kuwait, and gas uh, is, is usually uh, imported from uh, other countries, uh, from Qatar and Iran sometimes. Uh, the Ministry of Water, uh, Electricity and Water, MEW, consumes between 340, 350,000 barrels uh, of oil equivalent per day, and that's a, a large number, to produce this electricity and water. And this is something to, to, uh, to remember the next time uh, we, we turn lights on and wash our cars and just do, uh, we, we, we need to, to think about that really because we're burning oil to produce uh, these commodities. And we really need uh, to think about it and, and try to be wise. So, and this one is equivalent to 11 to 13% of daily oil production, this, this number. Um, and of course, the electricity demand keeps rapidly rising with annual uh, growth rate of 6% because of the growth in population and uh, urbanization of, of the desert areas. 
uh, and of course opening the uh, new businesses and and uh, other commercial uh, industrial uh, activities and the prediction is this oil uh, equivalent consumption will reach 500,000 500, uh, by the year 2030 2030 and the co2 emissions uh, is 40 million tons per year and of course it will also increase with the increase of the oil consumption to 65 uh, million tons per year by uh, 2030. And this is a figure just to show the, uh, the current consumption and also uh, the future uh, prediction uh, for Kuwait. We can see that the electric load and the water on the, on the right of the screen in millions imperial gallons per day, that's MIGD, and uh, the electricity is in uh, gigawatts. And we can see that there will be an increase and if the water consumption will have been doubled from 2010 to 2030. Also, uh, let's uh, look at the uh, different uh, generation technologies that we are currently using uh, in power plants. And uh, on the right hand side, we can see these uh, letters open, uh, open cycle gas turbine, closed cycle gas turbine. And you have a gas, a gas turbine with MSF. MSF is multi stage flash desalination technology, which is a very old and uh, inefficient te uh, technology that uses steam. Uh, to produce fresh water from seawater. And then we have the uh, reheat steam power plants and the non-reheat steam power plants here at the end. Uh, currently, if you look at 2010 to 2018, 20, most of our electricity is produced from steam turbines, old uh, low efficiency steam turbines. But, but uh, the Ministry of Electricity Water have been working hard to change the situation to use the uh, combined cycle uh, gas turbines, which use gas and steam turbines to produce electricity, which, which are more efficient. And uh, if you look at the situation in 2028 or 2030, you will see that this closed, closed uh, cycle gas turbine will be uh, the dominant uh, technology uh, during the, these later years. And uh, of course, uh, the installed capacity is on the left of the screen, and this is a generations in uh, terawatt hours. Uh, also here, uh, if, we, if we look at the different sectors consuming uh, energy in the country, we see that the residential uh, sector makes up 61% uh, of the total. And this because of the heavy use of air conditioning during most of the year. Uh, it used to be uh, like seven, uh, six months of the year. Now, uh, you know, with the change in the, in the uh, environment uh, that we use air conditioning almost all year round. And this is causing, causing this, this heavy use of energy at the residential sector. Also, uh, the commercial se sector takes a big chunk uh, of the, the energy consumption. It's because also of, of, of use of uh, probably air conditioning also uh, during the day and afternoons and evenings even. So this is also something to think about uh, as we go along in the presentation. Um, here, uh, we can see the uh, that the energy uh, generation capacity available by MEW is is uh, is not bad. It is covering the rising consumption uh, in the country. They they're always planning uh, new power plants and uh, refurbishment of of old turbines to keep up with the the increasing uh, demand. So the plans are there, but it is an expensive option to build new power plants uh, for electricity and, and uh, water desalination 
uh, and also it is consuming our uh, oil. And uh, just just to, to to emphasize the point that the Ministry of Electricity and Water is is, is planning uh, its uh, generation uh, reserve capacity. We see that they have also plans to add to the different power plants uh, in the country in the in the coming 10, uh, 10 years. Uh, I, I think these figures are also important to look at. The, the, the figure on the right shows the emissions per capita in Kuwait compared to the European Union, uh, Middle East countries, and the world. And we can see we are way higher than the three aforementioned uh, sectors. We can see that... Uh, compared to the, to the whole world average, we are much higher. It's almost less than five uh, tons. And in Kuwait, it, it will reach, I don't know, in the, in the years, in the coming years, uh, 25, more or less. Uh, also here, uh, the figure on the left, it's uh, CO2 equivalent emissions by sector and uh, the electricity generation is, is responsible for mo uh, most of the CO2 emissions in the country, the, the power plants, the steam and gas uh, turbine power plants. Uh, electric uh, electricity consumption per capita in Kuwait compared uh, to average OECD countries and the GCC we can see that our, our consumption is, is also much higher than the average of the GCC and the average of the OECD. Uh, and these are important uh, facts to look at because uh, we need, if we talk about renewable energy, we need also to curb our consumption and think about energy efficiency. Uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, build a huge program of renewable energy installation without looking at uh, per capita consumption. So this is also important uh, for us. Uh, compared uh, to the Gulf nations, our uh, capacity, generation capacity is, is not high. We are uh, the, the third after Saudi Arabia, UAE, and the, and because of these are large countries with the, with the larger populations, that's why. But if we compare ourselves to Oman, which has a population uh, close to our population, 5 million, we are uh, double their generation capacity. So uh, the renewable resources uh, in Kuwait, first, I will uh, just talk about the definition of renewable energy. It is the energy from sources that are naturally replenishing, uh, but flow limited, which means they are sources that are inexhaustible in duration. They are available for us, but they are, uh, it's, the energy is available, uh, is limited uh, per unit time. It's intermittent. Basically, when I say that these energies are intermittent, you cannot use them most of them, you cannot use them all day long. And uh, an example of the different renewable energy uh, technologies or, or, or sources available uh, for us, it's solar, wind, uh, hydroelectric, geothermal, biomass, and tidal uh, energies. And these are available around the world. But for us in Kuwait, uh, I'll concentrate on uh, solar and wind energies. Hydroelectric, basically, you need running rivers and dams we don't have that in kuwait geothermal is, is getting the energy from the bottom of the earth uh, usually in scandinavian countries they're, they're uh, using this hot uh, steam or or hot water from the bottom of the earth to heat their houses biomass usually is is is, is good for countries with lots of plantations and forests and that tidal wave we can use it but we don't have large waves like 
uh, countries that uh, are located uh, next to the ocean. So solar and, and wind are basically the, the, the most suitable and feasible for us in Kuwait. Just uh, to emphasize the availability of the solar energy, if we talk in terms of reserves of, of different commodity, commodities, we can see the sun, this, uh, this, this whole square represents the sun, and these boxes, coal, oil, natural gas, and uranium. And compared to, to, the, to the available resources we have, this is in blue, the annual world energy consumption. It might have increased a little bit. Uh, this figure is, is, is a few years old. But uh, it, it says that we have lots of untapped potential. We have potential. We just need to work on uh, increasing the efficiency of the available technologies in solar or wind or uh, uh, other fields. The Earth's uh, energy budget uh, is uh, shown uh, in this figure. We can see that uh, not all the, the incoming solar energy is absorbed by, by the Earth, by land or oceans. And uh, the, the percentage we have available is, is almost half to 60% of, of, of the energy. So uh, we will talk about this percentage and this this coming uh, sun ray or radiation to us can be is, is called first global horizontal uh, irradiation global horizontal irradiation radiation it can uh, it is divided into two components it's uh, divided into direct normal normal irradiation dni and diffuse horizontal irradiation dhi and of course, uh, if, you, if you want to define irradiance, it is the output of energy from the sun received at an area on the earth. So it is measured by watts per meter squared. Uh, and uh, as I said, it is uh, divided into two components. Uh, and this is important why I will mention it now. Uh, and this is just the equation, the, the diffuse horizontal radiation plus uh, the direct normal radiation, the times uh, the cosine of the uh, solar zenith angle gives us the, the, the global horizontal uh, radiation. And uh, it's important uh, to know uh, these components because uh, not all so, uh, solar uh, technologies uh, can use both components. Uh, for example, uh, the photovoltaics uh, and uh, concentrated uh, uh, panels need uh, can use global horizontal irradiation. There is no problem. Uh, PV also photovoltaics can use the di uh, the diffuse uh, horizontal irradiation. However, if you want to use the concentrated uh, solar power and use large scale PV plants, uh, you need uh, the uh, direct normal irradiation uh, uh, component of, 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 the, of, of the irradiance. So usually uh, the, uh, the, diffuse, the diffuse rays are uh, constitute 20% of the global uh, horizontal irradiation and the other component makes up 80% times the cosine of the theta, of course. And uh, this figure here, a small figure on the right, uh, shows you both, both components. The diffuse means that it is not absorbed directly by Earth, but it is uh, usually diffused by clouds and, and uh, other uh, elements uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, this is just another figure that shows you the different components of the solar irradiance and uh, what equipment is used uh, to, to, to measure them. I just don't want to complicate it. I will uh, just pass through it quickly. Uh, I like this, this map. When you show this map, it just tells you uh, how much uh, solar energy we, we have uh, in this region. Uh, in the red and pink region, 
basically here in the, uh, under the blue circle, uh, we can see that uh, it is, it is uh, feasible uh, to use solar energy uh, all, all year round basically in Kuwait because, because of the, the, the high uh, global horizontal uh, radiation uh, in this region. And uh, if we look at the different map uh, for Kuwait only, you can see that uh, we have two main uh, areas of global uh, horizontal irradiation. The north is a little bit uh, smaller in, 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 in number than the south of Kuwait. If we talk about the radiation in, in uh, kilowatt hour per meter squared. Looking at the direct normal uh, radiation for Kuwait, we can see that there are areas in, in, in red that the highest the highest number uh, in the in the east of Kuwait and the west of Kuwait. And what it tells us is that we can distribute the different technologies according uh, to this map. For example, we can use uh, normal PV panels uh, everywhere almost in Kuwait. But if you want the concentrated technologies, you have to look for, for the highest uh, direct radiation because this is what uh, these technologies uh, need. Uh, this, this figure also, uh, what it shows is that our uh, resource shown in one this is the sun uh, or the energy available from the sun for us. It corresponds with the cooling load for us in the summer, which means that uh, unlike Europe, we can use uh, available technologies uh, for cooling uh, using heat, not electricity. There is a thermal cooling chiller technology available around the world. Europe have tried it, but they didn't succeed because of, 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 of uh, the, the smaller uh, value of irradiance. But for us, uh, it's, it, 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 they correspond very well. So we can, we can use these other technologies. What it means is, I, what I want to say here is that we can diversify the, our technologies, our solar, uh, or renewable technologies that will be used in the country. We, we, we don't have to stick to PV only or concentrated power only. We can use other innovative available technologies for us because of the abundance of, of, of the sun energy. Uh, here, just another example of the global uh, radiation available for us corresponding to the, to the, to the peak load of air conditioning systems. So again, it just so shows that uh, the hottest hours in the country here in the bottom uh, correspond uh, to, the, to the highest uh, global radiation available. So we can tap into this uh, technology, the thermal cooling technology, which I will talk about later on in the presentation. So if we want to decide the, uh, divide the categories of the solar systems, there is solar thermal and solar photovoltaics. I will start by talking about solar thermal systems and the different uh, applications. So there are four main categories that we can use uh, solar water heating, solar space heating, solar power generation, uh, and thermal cooling systems. First, uh, let's look at the different uh, thermal collector categories uh, available uh, commercially and will develop. Non-concentrating collectors, which means that they don't need, need the direct normal uh, radiance, but they can use uh, global, uh, global horizontal radiation, uh, radiance. Uh, we have flat plate collectors, 
uh, and it is important to look at the temperatures. They give you a maximum of 90 degrees, which means if you have uh, demands for steam, you cannot go for this technology. Uh, this one heats water, doesn't give you steam. Uh, and uh, in the non-concentrating collector category, we have evacuated tube uh, collectors that you can use here for uh, low temperature steam, low pressure, low temperature steam uh, uh, demands. It gives you temperatures from 50 to 120 degrees. Also, there is one uh, there is one technology called the uh, volumetric air collector. It's, it's, it's not here. It, it's not used on a large scale like the other collectors. It basically uh, heats air, not, not water, because these collectors use water and uh, other fluids uh, to, 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 to absorb the heat from the sun. And then they heat the water. Uh, the volumetric air collector it's just a low, low temperature, 30, 40 degree uh, collector that heats the, uh, the, the air passing through the collector. And it's usually used in uh, uh, heating uh, swimming pools, uh, not the water, but the swimming pool uh, enclosure. And uh, they use them in the uh, agriculture industry to dry uh, fruits after washing them. Uh, this is just uh, not shown here. And in the concentrating collector uh, category, we have the line focused, uh, the line focused uh, technology, and it's called the linear uh, linear Fresnel. Uh, it's written Fresnel uh, here, but usually it is uh, pronounced linear Fresnel uh, reflector. And also we have the parabolic uh, trough collector. These are uh, uh, one category. Also we have the point uh, focus, not the line focus, but the, the sun rays that will be uh, uh, focused on the collector. Uh, we have the parabolic dish reflector and uh, we have the power tower. I will, I will show uh, examples of each uh, of each different uh, collector uh, technology and what uh, also we need to, to look at the temperature here these are usually used for large scale uh, power plant uh, uh, size uh, uh, demands uh, because they give you steam at very high pressure and high temperature here the the line focused go to a maximum of 400 and if you look at the point focused collectors, they go up to 2000 uh, degrees Celsius. For solar uh, water heating, uh, we can use the, the, the flat plate collectors and we can use the evacuated tubes uh, collectors. Uh, they're usually a small size. They can be installed uh, on rooftops or in basements or, or around the house uh, if there is available area. And uh, I mean, uh, to install the tanks. Uh, and uh, they are well developed, they are uh, cost effective, and uh, they are uh, used all over uh, the world now. Uh, and uh, in Kuwait, we need to look at that. Uh, maybe we can uh, somehow tap into that, uh, to this potential for heating water uh, in the winter. Uh, in the solar space uh, heating uh, field, we have two, uh, two options. There is a passive space heating. Basically, we're not using uh, solar correct collectors here, but uh, what we use is uh, different materials and different, uh, let, let's say, uh, mechanisms to to absorb uh, the, the sunlight or, or the, the the radiation to heat to heat houses. And of course, uh, for 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 uh, cold countries, they they orient 
the windows or the or the large area of the house to the south because this is where most of the sun comes from from uh, the south uh, south facing side so uh, the strategies are properly oriented windows also uh, you, you have to have a thermal mass means that you have thick uh, thick insulation uh, you have bricks and you use this thermal mass to keep the energy you absorb from the windows inside also uh, you, you have to have distribution mechanisms if you uh, collect uh, the the the, uh, the sun radiation from one side you have to have other mechanisms to spread it through the house you can use radiation uh, radiation like on the, on the figure here like these uh, underfloor uh, piping or uh, convection which means using a fan to distribute the heat and there's also convection uh, these are uh, passive uh, strategies uh, we can use uh, to to uh, to heat our houses but but for the summer also there are different strategies like the overhangs here because in the summer it is the, the sunlight comes uh, almost perpendicular so we can use these uh, overhangs in the houses or shades to 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 do the opposite to to prevent the sun coming uh, inside and heating the house uh, active space heating means that we use collectors to to absorb the the solar radiation and we combine it usually with 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 fans or pumps to to transfer or distribute uh, the heat uh, throughout uh, the building the house or the commercial building and if we use the thermal cooling technology we can also distribute the cold uh, to the different uh, sections of the building uh, solar power generation uh, all concentrating solar power uh, applications are uh, in the order of 100 megawatt or larger. They cannot be smaller because of the, the size and also the cost of the system. That it means that it is used by utilities to generate uh, electricity and uh, then it is distributed to, uh, distributed to consumers. In a CS, uh, CSP plant, solar energy is converted to heat and the heat is used uh, in a conventional power cycle which means that we produce steam and then we have a steam turbine uh, to convert uh, the, the steam uh, to electricity uh, which, which means we're using mechanical power and then we use a generator to generate the electricity uh, there are four main uh, concentrated solar power systems, the parabolic trough collectors, the uh, line focus uh, Fresnel reflectors, uh, a central receiver power tower, and finally the point focus uh, receiver dish. Uh, the dish, they call it the, the Stirling engine uh, system. Uh, this figure just shows uh, the four technologies uh, I mentioned in, 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 in one place. Here you have the parabolic trough system. You have a concentrator which reflects all the sun rays into the receiver, and the receiver usually it has uh, uh, oil uh, inside. This oil will will get heated, and then it will uh, have a, we have a heat exchanger that the oil will will heat uh, and evaporate uh, the water. And this one, the solar tower, basically have uh, the reflectors all around this tower that reflect uh, the sun, the sun rays uh, onto the receiver on top of the tower. Then uh, also uh, you generate steam. And this is the dish uh, slash engine system. And finally, the, the 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 line or the linear funnel are usually not uh, are usually. Uh, put uh, horizontally uh, onto the service. A parabolic uh, trough example, this is what it looks like. Uh, if you see this figure, these are the reflectors uh, here and the receiver go goes uh, all, all the way to the end. And uh, this is uh, a CSP power plant. Uh, <laughs> 
the, the pictures here show the linear Fresnel CSP. Uh, it is basically uh, the same concept as the uh, parabolic trough, but it is uh, less expensive because you don't have to to uh, work uh, uh, complicated uh, and manufacturing process to to manufacture these linear these linear collectors. Also, uh, what, what it does is it has another reflector on top on top of the, 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 the receiver. The receiver is at the top there, and there is also like uh, a reflector covering the receiver. So basically anything that gets reflected and it's, it's going up, it will also get reflected again uh, on the receiver. Uh, it, is, uh, it is relatively new compared to the other CSP technologies. Uh, but it's now widely used uh, around the world. Uh, there is a video here. Uh, I will let you... Consistent sunshine. Three, four, three, four There's plenty of it in the United States, especially the Southwest. That's why concentrating solar power, or CSP, is a natural fit for utilities generating clean electricity and for creating clean energy jobs in the U.S. Power towers are one type of CSP system that uses large flat mirrors to reflect sunlight onto a solar receiver at the top of a centrally located tower. Fluid heated in the receiver produces steam, which spins a conventional turbine to generate electricity. In the 1980s and 90s, U.S. Department of Energy projects in California demonstrated that power towers could collect and store heat to generate utility-scale electricity 24 hours a day. And today, power towers continue to build a clean energy economy. In 2009, a modular two-tower system with 24,000 mirrors in the Mojave Desert powers more than 5,000 homes. And in 2010, Construction began on a 370 megawatt three tower system with nearly 175,000 mirrors. This California plant created more than 1,000 jobs and powers more than 350,000 homes. Let's shine some light on the point focus technology behind power towers. Thousands of mirrors called heliostats reflect sunlight onto a receiver on top of a tower. These computer-controlled mirrors move to maintain this focus from dawn to dusk. In a steam power tower, water is pumped to the receiver where concentrated thermal energy heats it to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of the super-hot steam is stored in a tank, while most is sent to the power block. Here, high-pressure steam spins a conventional turbine to produce electricity. One of CSP's great advantages is that thermal energy can be stored for later use. If a cloud blocks the sun, the steam stored in the tank is used to continue to produce electricity for up to an hour. Another system uses molten salt instead of water. Cold molten salt is pumped to the receiver, where it is heated, then flows to a hot storage tank. The hot salt then flows through a heat exchanger where heat is transferred to water, producing steam that spins the turbine. The molten salt then flows back to the cold storage tank. In extended cloudy periods or at night, the stored hot salt can continue to produce steam and generate electricity reliably for hours. Today, innovation continues to drive down costs and boost efficiency so power towers can supply utility-scale power, providing dependable, clean electricity to homes, businesses, and communities. Power towers reflect America's shift to a prosperous, clean energy future. Uh, the next uh, slide uh, will uh, also uh, contains a short video on the uh, dish sterling engine. Energy from the sun is reflected by the sun catcher's parabolic dish and focused onto a sterling engine, the system's highly efficient power conversion unit. 
Highly concentrated rays heat the receiver to 720 degrees Celsius. The sun's heat causes the hydrogen gas to expand and drive a series of four pistons. At the back of the engine, a radiator cools the gas, causing it to contract, and the gas is recirculated in a continuous process. The pistons turn a generator, which produces an electrical output of 25 kilowatts, far more efficiently than any other solar power generating technology. No combustion, no emissions, and hermetically sealed to minimize maintenance. With $500 million of investment and over 20 years of testing, the Suncatcher represents the next generation of solar power, available for global deployment. Using a sophisticated tracking system, each Suncatcher follows the movement of the sun throughout the day and then returns to a stow position each evening, ready to repeat the cycle for the following day. The Suncatcher is a truly sustainable energy solution with a number of economic and technical advantages over other solar platforms. The Suncatcher requires water only to clean the dishes, consuming a fraction of the water used by other solar thermal systems. This has significant siting, economic and environmental advantages. Uh, I think this is enough just to, to show us the, the, the concept of the dish sterling engine. And we move on uh, from CSP to thermal cooling systems. And uh, we can divide the cooling processes into two uh, main categories, uh, closed systems, which use chilled water to, cir to circulate uh, the produced uh, cooling, and open systems that use air instead of chilled water, and usually, uh, these open systems uh, are called sorbent technologies, or they have two types also. They usually condition the air. They don't chill the, the, the air. It means that they reduce the temperature by a certain degrees, but uh, because of that, they are not uh, usually suitable for uh, hot regions such as Kuwait. So I will uh, not talk about them to, uh, tonight. I will mention uh, or just uh, briefly uh, look at the absorption uh, chiller technology or process and the adsorption chiller and uh, the main difference between uh, these two technologies. First, uh, if we want to understand the thermal uh, cooling cycle, we have to compare it to the conventional cycle. In a conventional uh, air conditioning, we have four main components. We have the, uh, the figure on the, on the left is the conventional cycle. We have the condenser. We have uh, the com mechanical compressor, which needs electricity uh, to, to do the work. And we have an evaporator that uh, produces uh, the cooling for the space, and we have the expansion valve. Uh, in a thermal process, we don't wanna, want to use uh, electricity, so we have to replace the mechanical compressor uh, with something else uh, we, 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 we call a thermal compressor, which means we just add new components that do the work of the mechanical compressor uh, for for an absorption uh, chiller, absorption cycle, this thermal, uh, this thermal compressor is usually uh, combines or combines three components, the generator, the heat exchanger, and the absorber. You see that here we don't have a compressor. We have a evaporator, condenser, and of course we have a valve, expansion valve, but we have a generator and we have an absorber. And of course, a heat exchanger in between to, to use the excess heat in the system uh, to heat the, the material that's going, the fluid that's going up to the generator to save energy. The, uh, what happens in this uh, system, the absorption cycle, the heat from the sun, if, if you can imagine having uh, a collector, a flat plate collector or, or uh, an evacuated tube. These two collectors I mentioned before are suitable for this kind of technology. 
because the single effect, if we look at the single effect absorption cycle, it needs uh, hot water at 90 degree. It doesn't need steam. So you can use the, the very cost uh, effective feasible uh, flat blade collectors to, to run it. So what happens is you, you introduce the heat to the generator, to the generator of, of, of the cycle. And this is how it uh, starts, generator, condenser, valve, evaporator, then the absorber. And this is uh, going back to the generator, it completes the cycle. Uh, we don't have to go uh, deeply into, into the process. Uh, I just wanted to say that we have an option of an absorption cycle to use uh, solar to run it. And the, the single effect basically has one generator uh, the double effect uh, absorption has two generators, which means it, it needs higher temperatures, which means we cannot use the flat plate, we need steam for it. So it is a more expensive system, but uh, it is an available technology uh, and we can use. Uh, they are bulky chillers, it's just I wanted to show photos of, of, of the absorption chiller. They are bulky and, and require a large space to, to put them. Then also uh, in the system, you have the, 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 the cold water tanks if you wanna uh, store your, your cooling for uh, nightly use when you don't have sun. Also, there is the, the hot water tank also in the system to, to store the hot, the hot water from uh, the solar collector. So it is a bulky large system. It can be expensive because of the collectors and, 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 and the chiller. Maybe that's it not wide, widely used around the world. Uh, we have the adsorption chiller and uh, the, the, the difference between these two is in the absorption technology, in the absorption, in the, in the absorber, in the absorber of, of, of the system, we use a, a sludge, a combination of, of, of uh, two, two materials, uh, usually lithium bromide with water. It's, it is a sludge basically, but it is water and steam. And uh, this, this sludge, it absorbs the heat uh, from the system. Here in the adsorption, we have a different solid material uh, that absorbs, absorbs the, the heat in the system. And then it is regenerated basically to, 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 to drive the heat away. Uh, and these, these uh, don't give you a low temperature uh, cooling, the, these kind of chillers. Uh, so uh, they might not be suitable for Kuwait, but is, it is worth mentioning and looking at uh, because they don't need uh, expensive collectors. They need uh, low temperature co collectors. So uh, usually with, with renewable energy, you have to optimize. You, do, you look at different collector technologies, you look at different uh, ch chiller technologies and you optimize the system according to your needs or to, to, the, to the cost. And these are also, uh, they can come in bulky in the large, in the large capacity uh, uh, category. They can be bulky, but in, in small capacities, they can be small and uh, used uh, domestically. Uh, moving on uh, from thermal technologies to uh, solar photovoltaic uh, systems. The simplest system uh, power the small calculator, uh, as, as we all know. These are the small ones. And more complicated systems will provide a large portion of the electricity in the near future. Because uh, PV systems have been rapidly increasing in capacity and uh, decreasing in cost. And that's why it, it is a well uh, used and largely uh, it's spread all over the world and uh, used everywhere. When basically how it works, when photons strike a PV cell, they may reflected or absorbed. The, the absorbs, uh, the absorbed the photons generate electricity, and uh, then it is transferred to electrons of the solar cell. It is composed. The, the the PV system is mainly composed of PV modules, inverters, 
combiner boxes and cables. And of course, you need a mounting, a mounting uh, structure and then a transformer to transfer transfer the, the uh, electricity and you have a switch gear. And this is how it looks like, and this is how it works. Uh, the sunlight hits, and uh, then the, the 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 atoms, the photo, the, are, the electrons are excited, and then uh, the the electricity is generated and collected, and they can be installed in, in different arrays. Then, and you can size the system according uh, to the needed uh, demand or consumed capacity. And uh, just the fact I came across, I wanted to put that the highest efficiency ever recorded for a PV panel uh, was recorded in 2006, and it, is up, it was about 41%, which is miraculous. As we know, uh, usually the, uh, the efficiencies range between 15 and 18, 20%. Uh, the, the different technologies uh, will be shown in the next few slides. We have thin film solar panels. Uh, they are uh, made of different uh, materials. Uh, this is how they look like. They can be used as solar collectors mounted on the ground and they can be uh, uh, combined with the facade of, of, of buildings. And uh, the other two types are made of silicon. There is a, a monocrystalline uh, solar panel and the polycrystalline uh, panel. If we want to compare the three, the three main collector PV collector types, uh, the monocrystalline, of course, is made of single silicon, silicon crystal. Uh, the efficiency is considered high. It is 18% or a little bit higher, but it comes with a high cost. Uh, and these are just the different color appearances. The, the polycrystalline uh, has a medium efficiency, 15 to 17. Uh, the cost is also high. Thin film te te technology is the cheapest, it has the lowest uh, cost, but it comes with the, also the lowest uh, efficiency. Uh, according to one expert I spoke to, uh, polycrystalline panels are disappearing from, from markets. Now uh, most, most uh, installed uh, systems uh, are made of monocrystalline uh, panels. I think because of the, the cost, it is decreasing. Also, uh, it comes with a high efficiency. Uh, all three types are suitable for Kuwait, for, for the, the high temperatures of Kuwait, uh, and they can be used. It just depends on, on the, three, the three main uh, requirements, uh, cost, generation, capacity, and efficiency. You also here have to optimize and, and do a, a pre-feasibility study to, to see what's su suitable for, for your needs. Uh, if we look at uh, the latest PV solar technologies in engineer, engineering wise, not material wise, there is the, the bifacial solar panel, which means it can, it can uh, produce electricity from both sides. It can absorb heat from uh, both sides, the bifacial. There is the concentrated PV uh, photovoltaic cell, uh, which collects the, the sun ray at, at, at a focal point, just like the, uh, the CSP we talked about. It is a large system and expensive. There is the solar tiles. These tiles uh, are basically uh, put on, on, on the, in the outer facade or the, uh, the outer space of, of buildings. And the, the, it, can, it, it, it looks good and it can also generate electricity. Uh, finally, uh, a new a kind of new technology and expensive. It's not still uh, widely used. Transparent solar solar uh, panels, which means it can uh, absorb uh, uh, light wave that we cannot see. Which means in the future, if, if if these panels can be manufactured at a reasonable price, that 
all our devices can generate electricity, basically, because they, 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 you need transparent glass uh, to produce, uh, to, to absorb the, the, the sunlight and produce electricity. So windows, phones, computer screens, they all can be made of this transparent uh, panel. And uh, I think it is uh, made uh, or discovered uh, in MIT. Uh, there is another uh, technology that's not, not new, but uh, it is not very widely used. It is the solar photovoltaic thermal panel, uh, which absorbs the heat on the top to produce electricity. And the, the excess heat is absorbed uh, in the bottom of, 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 of the cell or in, in the uh, inner layer to produce heat. Uh, you either can, it can either be uh, an, uh, an, air, uh, an air collector, it can, it can uh, heat the air or it can be water-based, basically. If we look at the pros and cons of this system, uh, the, the advantages, uh, you can combine two technologies in one panel. Uh, you save on the heating bills and also uh, produce electricity at the same time. Uh, this is for the West, they have uh, separate heating bills. Uh, the collected heat serves as cooling system for the PV part. Usually, uh, what I didn't mention is uh, PV panels uh, usually deteriorate in efficiency if, if, if their temperature exceeds a, a certain uh, number. It doesn't mean more, more uh, or higher temperature, doesn't mean higher efficiency in this system. Uh, so what, it happens, what happens in these uh, kind of panels, it basically cools, cools the, 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 the outer layer, and so the efficiency remains uh, high. Uh, the cons or the disadvantages it's not easy to install and control uh, with other appliances in the house. Uh, in the summertime, when you need to produce the electricity, you don't have uh, a demand for the hot water. So you have surplus heated water you don't know what to do with. Uh, it is uh, higher in cost and usually comes uh, in, in uh, large size. So it's not fit for households uh, or uh, rooftops. It is uh, just a picture of, of uh, PV uh, plants. Uh, I would like to just show a few slides of, of the different projects we've done at uh, the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, KISR, um, in uh, co uh, cooperation with different uh, uh, institutes in Kuwait. For example, this project here, uh, uh, we installed uh, in, uh, on Kisser grounds and in, uh, in our uh, kept uh, facilities. Basically, uh, it is a testing facility for the different PV panels that are imported in Kuwait. Any company that wants to, uh, to come to uh, a third party, let's say, to, to test the efficiency and the usability of, of, of their panels, they can, can come to this testing facility to test uh, the, pan the solar panels. And uh, we did a project for uh, the buildings of the Ministry of Electricity uh, Water. It is a uh, rooftop uh, integrated and uh, grid connected. It means that it, it, it can be connected to the grid and uh, uh, the network uh, can use the, the electricity produced from these uh, panels. Uh, there is a project also for the uh, PV and also solar water heating for Kuwait Court Complex, uh, the new one. Um, Umagdir uh, Field Solar Plant, uh, it is also grid connected. Uh, PV, and these are the, the details uh, of, of the system. It, is, it was commissioned in 2016. Uh, finally, there is the well-known, uh, well-talked about uh, Al Shigaya uh, Renewable uh, Park. 
which includes uh, the, 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 the three technologies, wind, CSP, and uh, PV. It is targeted uh, to, to produce uh, 5,000 gigawatt hour uh, of energy uh, per year. So if we want to take a uh, talk about the, the three phases, uh, the, the first phase uh, is made of 70 megawatts of, of, of uh, available capacity, 50 from CSP, 10 megawatts from PV, and 10 megawatts from wind. Uh, it is operational now. Uh, phase two uh, will, uh, the plant will reach, it will give 100 megawatts and these are the distributions and uh, final extension phase three, uh, that the capacity will go to 2000 megawatts. But uh, it is uh, in the uh, very uh, early stages of uh, construction and installation. And this is just uh, another uh, detailed picture of the PV uh, plant. The, uh, of course, it is a grid connected as well at the Al Shigaya. This is a CSP plant. Uh, it is a picture in its early stages of, of construction. Uh, let's go through wind energy and it won't take a long time. I think uh, time is running. It's been an hour already. Uh, uh, is it okay just to have uh, probably 10 to 20 minutes uh, more? Okay. Uh, so uh, first let's talk about the wind uh, potential uh, for Kuwait because uh, we have a huge potential uh, to use wind energy, wind turbines in Kuwait. Uh, but uh, we are not. It's just one one uh, plant at Al Shigaya. So uh, anyway, let's let's look at the numbers. Uh, the data on wind speed, direction, frequency distribution uh, were used to analyze the wind energy at five locations in Kuwait, and the map shows the five locations. Uh, and this table here, I, I would like to, to talk about just before I continue. It is the, classi the cla la classification of wind speed and wind uh, power density. Uh, it's a global classification that tells you uh, if, if, if a certain site is, is, is usable or suitable for inst installing a, a wind turbine. Uh, so it, it, it ranges from fair to, to excellent. The, the data shows that Al Huemliya and Al Tawil Al Wafra sites are the highest in, in uh, WPD wind power density. Al Huemliya in the north and Al Tawil and Al Wafra uh, in the south are, are the best three sites for installing wind turbines. Usually, uh, if, if you increase the height of, of, of the turbine, uh, you, you will get more power because it will be more uh, windier uh, at, at, at higher, uh, at higher uh, meters. And you can go to up, up to 100 meters, not only 30. But uh, wind speeds are highest in June and July in Kuwait. In the summer, we have more winds than the winter, by the way. And it can be between moderate and good. And uh, in some, in, in Al Huemliya, it, it gets to uh, the excellent uh, classification. As height of wind turbine is increased from 10 to 30 meters, the wind power density for all location increases. For Al Huemliya and Al Wafra, it becomes in the excellent category in these two, especially in th these two months. Uh, Kuwait, according to, to a colleague of mine, uh, who is a wind expert, is, is in, the, in, the, in the top countries in wind potential uh, for onshore wind uh, farms. 
because uh, if we divide uh, wind farms, they can be onshore. And of course, like different countries in Europe, they're using uh, offshore uh, wind turbines to produce the electricity. Uh, currently, uh, the wafer allocation is, 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 is restricted uh, because of the, the, the oil sector and uh, the oil installations there. And uh, we hope that uh, we can tap into this uh, potential at, at these uh, sites uh, and, and uh, install wind turbines. The two, the two types of wind turbines uh, are the horizontal access wind turbines. Uh, if we look at the left of the, the screen, they are the conventional propeller uh, looking uh, turbines. And this, the uh, vert and on the right, the vertical access wind turbines, which is connected from the top uh, and the bottom of the pole. And uh, they are, uh, these vertical access turbines, uh, they are described as omnidirectional, which means you don't have to adjust uh, to adjust them to face uh, the, the incoming wind direction. You can install them anywhere and they can, they can produce, uh, produce electricity uh, opposite uh, to the conventional horizontal axis turbine. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, again, with Shigaya, as I mentioned before, we have a 10 megawatt capacity wind, uh, tur uh, wind turbine plant, which is a grid, a grid collected, uh, connected. The wind turbines uh, are five, each with a capacity of two, uh, two megawatts. The manufacturer is uh, Siemens uh, Gamisa. Gamisa is a Spanish uh, company that produces wind turbines. They were, uh, I think, bought recently by, by Siemens. So it's called now Siemens Gamisa. It is a conventional uh, technology with a gearbox. Uh, it will pr pr give uh, a range of 38 to 42 megawatt hour uh, of electricity per year. And it is, uh, been, it, it's been operational since July 2017. Alternative uh, energy, uh, basically, uh, I didn't call it a renewable energy because uh, it's not using the conventional resources I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, one of the technologies I want to to uh, to mention, I think it's been mentioned by a colleague of mine uh, a few weeks ago, anaerobic digestion. Uh, it is using uh, the sludge from uh, wastewater treatment uh, to to produce uh, a biogas. This the biogas will be used uh, in a conventional uh, turbine, a gas turbine, or an engine. Uh, to produce uh, electricity. For Kuwait, anaerobic digestion has a great potential to be both a waste management technology and a clean source of uh, energy. This, uh, these are uh, different pictures of the, the, the process. These are the tanks that keep the, the sludge of the wastewater. And basically you pre-treat it and then you use the anaerobic digestion uh, process to separate, uh, uh, to, to produce the biogas. And then uh, you take it to the CHP uh, unit, which means uh, combined heat and power. You can produce heat and produce also power uh, uh, from, from uh, the biogas. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, at Kisser, uh, we recently uh, received a grant from uh, the Kuwait Foundation of Science, KFS, to install uh, and test this uh, process uh, in Kuwait. Uh, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, I am uh, part of this uh, project that will start uh, in the coming few months. Uh, waste incineration is an important alternative option for us in Kuwait. We all know the waste problem in Kuwait. We don't have uh, a waste recycling or waste management uh, uh, 
option in Kuwait. Basically, it's just mixed waste, all thrown, and then taken to, to landfills uh, to be haphazardly uh, uh, landfilled there. So uh, this technology uh, we can look at and uh, think about. Basically, you burn, you incinerate the, the, the waste to produce steam, then the steam also is taken to the steam turbine and you can get electricity. And the amount of waste we have uh, can certainly uh, be used to produce large amounts of uh, electricity in, uh, for Kuwait. And uh, I, I wanted to show this, this picture here in the, in the bottom right to say that these plants look dirty in the inside, but outside you can integrate them with urban areas. You can put them next to the houses. They don't smell. And if you use the right abatement and filters, uh, here, if you look at this figure, we have different three, four filters uh, that can uh, get rid of all the toxic uh, uh, gases and the smells. And of course, it is kept the facility itself where you can see the, the, the waste. Uh, is kept under negative pressure, which means the, the, the smell cannot escape to the outside. It is kept inside. And uh, it is widely used in Japan now, in, in Denmark, in Germany. Uh, I think in Kuwait, uh, uh, they were planning uh, with, with the municipality to, to, uh, to build this plant. I don't know what happened, but uh, they, they, have, they have a plan to, to use this uh, technology. Uh, this is uh, a poster uh, I made with my colleagues uh, for uh, Kuwait University last year. Uh, it, uh, it shows the results of a study, a desktop study using uh, a software that uh, I did with my colleagues. Uh, and it won uh, third uh, place in its uh, category. If, if someone is interested to look at this uses the, the, the incineration uh, technology. So uh, let's take a breath and look at the future and our vision. In 2012, uh, His Highness, the late uh, Sheikh uh, Sabah Al Ahmed, uh, gave a speech uh, uh, in the United Nations for the opening of the climate change uh, conference. And in this speech, he uh, pledged that Kuwait will be producing 15% of its electricity uh, by 2030. And this has been uh, our guiding policy, basically, since, since that speech. Uh, and uh, this is the vision. And we need uh, to work towards that vision uh, in a, let's uh, say, uh, faster speed. Uh, to, to, to reach the goal in, uh, in 2030. Despite Kuwait's vast solar resource and wind resources, the country has only recently st started to harness its potential. The first renewable energy plant uh, is built in Shigaya. Today, it accounts for less than 1% of the total generating capacity, which is about 19 uh, gigawatts the capacity uh, today in Kuwait in 2021, it's 18.8 gigawatts. So it's just 1% of that, the Shigaya complex. Uh, it is expected to, 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 get, to increase to five uh, gigawatt, uh, but it, it, it will be still short of, of the Amir's uh, stated goal. Kuwait is planning a significant expansion, hopefully, uh, but, there is an expansion also in conventional uh, plants that use oil and gas, combined cycle plants. Uh, this, this figure is, is I think, from uh, the, the, the Kuwait's energy outlook. And it shows that uh, in 2015, of course, uh, steam turbines uh, are used to, to produce most of our electricity. And uh, in, 2000, in 2035, we want to reduce that percentage by half or more. Uh, 
we can see also uh, combined cycle units are also used. We want to increase that because they are more efficient and they use natural gas instead of oil. And then we want, and we have almost zero renewables in 2015. We want to increase that to 15% as we stated before. Uh, so what's the vision? Uh, Kuwait will increase the share of renewable uh, mix, the supply mix, but also to ensure sustainability, uh, socioeconomic development and uh, conformity to uh, with, with local and global environmental concern. And we want to position uh, Kuwait uh, as, as a leader in, in the renewable energy. This is, uh, this is uh, the dream or the goal. Uh, in technologies and in the development of RE. The policy uh, strategy's main goal is to achieve about 10% before 2030. And by 2030, we have to, to, to reach the 15% uh, the goal. And, and uh, the vision states that we will focus on solar and wind technology, which makes uh, sense for us. Uh, also, development of national related capabilities in business and engineering. We have uh, a plan that says we need policies, regulations, policies, regulations, which we lack now. And uh, I would like to use this opportunity to, to, uh, to say that the, the people listening now, they can go to their local, uh, to, the, to their MPs, the, the members of parliament, and uh, talk to them about uh, renewable energies and the need for policies, progressive policies, to be able to, to cement the use and spread of, of renewable energy uh, in Kuwait. So there are different incentives and regulations uh, countries have used successfully uh, to to increase the the, the use of uh, solar and wind energies there is uh, the grid code we have to have a grid code uh, which means that uh, there will be uh, mechanisms and regulations on how the pv uh, panels that people install on their houses or businesses install uh, on their buildings how they can be connected to the grid because now we don't have a law and the minister of electric water won't allow anybody to to tap into the grid so it is illegal and there is net metering basically it is a billing mechanism uh, that credit solar energy system owners uh, for the electricity that added to the grid basically they are re reimbursed by uh, for the electricity they they, uh, they produce feed in tariffs they are fixed fees uh, paid to renewable energy producers for each unit of energy produced and injected into the grid. The, the, the payment is guaranteed usually for a long period of time, 15 to 20 years, to ensure that uh, the owner uh, covers the installation cost and makes uh, a profit. And there is a rebate uh, program, which basically uh, gives cash, cash uh, rebate uh, to the to the people who purchase PV systems. So if, if, if a system co uh, costs you a thousand dinars, maybe the government would give you back a hundred or two hundred uh, KDs back in cash, just to incentivize and, and encourage people to uh, install these systems. Uh, remarks. The real challenge here uh, is the development of a sustainable energy system energy efficiency and alternative energy. So there are, as I, as I mentioned before, the alternative energy part. RE is only part of the solution. It's not the whole solution. Uh, RE for us, renewable energy for us in Kuwait can be complementary. It's not a base generation system because it is intermittent and we use air conditioning uh, morning, day, and night, and uh, so renewable energy cannot solve that problem. Uh, but it, it helps. Uh, we should uh, use it along with the, the different conventional technologies. 
R A uh, R E uh, sorry shouldn't be only evaluated based on cost effectiveness. R E in Kuwait is ex is expected to develop new economic sectors that offer new business and uh, job opportunities. So it might be expensive and uh, currently, but as it is spread and used, it will uh, go down in cost and will also benefit the economy. Basically, uh, you will have more jobs and more businesses. Uh, related to the RE uh, technology. So what are the challenges uh, that we face now or will face in the future as we uh, plan to uh, to use renewable energies? So we need, we need policy and uh, regulatory body requirements, and then we need codes and regulations. We need government funding, uh, subsidies, not for this electricity uh, uh, we're using now, but subsidies for RE uh, systems such as solar and wind. And we need feed-in tariffs. Uh, there's a lack of accurate data on RE resources uh, and the performance of the commercially viable RE technologies. The accurate data will support an accurate decision-making. So, so this is important. Uh, we need a technical base capable of supporting emerges, emerging industries uh, and enterprises related to RE. Uh, we, then we can place Kuwait as a leader in the industry uh, within the region. We need infrastructure and building requirements, uh, transmission of produced electri uh, electricity availability, as we talked before, uh, a law for uh, grid uh, connection. Land availability. Some some countries, uh, they come, they 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 uh, give free land. Kuwait, we do that also for for different industries. But land needs to be available also uh, uh, for free or at a reasonable price, so this industry can flourish. Finally, uh, we need training and human resources in the field, which we lack uh, currently. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, to this presentation today. Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan. And let me just say, as someone from a non-scientific background, thank you so much for simplifying renewable energy and making it in layman terms. I'm and glad. <laughs> thank you so much. And one hour is definitely not enough for a hot topic such as renewable energy and sustainable energy as well. Yes, true. And on a final note, congratulations on being part of the project that's funded by KPAS. We at Sheikh Abdullah Salam Cultural Center wish you all the best with that. Thank you very much. I hope uh, we can uh, be successful, successful in implementing uh, this technology. I'm sure you will be. And now we have a lot of questions because like I said, it is a hot topic. And if you have any questions or input, please type it into the chat and we will be answering them shortly. So for our first question, Dr. Hassan, do you believe that renewable energy sources could stop or halter global warming? Uh, this is a controversial topic, actually. But yes, I do believe that uh, CO2 is, is, is definitely, and the other harmful gases uh, are part of the problem, and RE is part of the solution. And uh, yes, uh, they can help, but not, not totally halt uh, the deterioration in, in our uh, climate. But yes, they can help. Our second question is, what is the difference between stored and instantaneous renewable energy? <clears throat> uh, let, let me uh, make it simple by giving you uh, an example using a certain technology like PV. Uh, PV technology itself, you need the sunlight during the day to produce electricity, yes? So you have a panel that produces electricity. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, storage. So basically this is instantaneous now. During the day, you can use it. During the night, you cannot. So if, if you want to use this renewable energy, the PV, uh, the energy from PV during the night, you add a certain component, which is a battery. So if you add a, pa a battery to the system and then uh, increase the capacity of your system by a certain percentage. 
So what happens during the day, you are producing electricity and storing the, the excess energy in that battery. And then you can use, uh, use it at night, but of course this will add to the expense, the cost of, of the system. But the technology is available and the batteries are being developed uh, every day. So this is that. So this question is, which renewable energy source is the best? Is solar better than wind or is it just circumstantial? It is circumstantial. It, de it, it depends uh, on what's available on, on a certain day. Uh, you have to, uh, let me, see, let me uh, tell you that uh, we can compare it to, to a business or investment portfolio. You have to have a portfolio of renewable energy technologies. You have uh, PV, you have CSP, you have wind, you have uh, energy from waste, and you have the conventional uh, power plants. And you try to optimize your use of all these systems. Uh, this is how, how it is done. You cannot say one technology is better than that, but, but uh, there are technologies that are uh, more cost effective than others. For example, PV, why, why is it uh, used everywhere? Because the price has gone down and the efficiency has gone up. So it makes sense that they're using it more than using uh, CSP, for example. Yes. So can the heat in the summer be used in some sort of way to produce electricity other than the light rays produced by the sun? Uh, the heat, yes, uh, PV cells, PV cells, they don't have to have uh, uh, a di direct uh, irradiance. They, 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 uh, PV cells need, uh, or they can use the, the, uh, the global irradiance. For example, if there is, it's a cloudy day, but it is a hot day, and you have some sort of, of, of heat or sun, uh, you can use PV. This is an example. This question is about tidal energy, which you spoke yes. about earlier. Yes. Is there energy from it in the Gulf? No, it hasn't been used. Uh, there are maybe maybe experimental uh, projects, but I don't think uh, there is uh, a commercial installation, no. So why would the oil sector restrict wind turbines in Al-Wafra? Aren't they two different technologies? Oh, uh, it's, it's not about uh, a competition. What I'm saying is there are certain uh, closed areas uh, that contain uh, oil, oil wells, refineries, uh, pipes, these uh, sort of uh, oil, oil sector related uh, issues. And that, that, that's all. Yeah, I believe sometimes people think it is a competition, like we're here first, you can't join us here. <laughs> no, no, it's not that. <laughs> It's can just security. Oh, I see. So can renewable energy replace fossil fuels? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it cannot. For us in Kuwait, uh, we have the problem of, of uh, cooling, air conditioning uh, consumption. And, and that will always be there. And it is very high. Uh, unless maybe in the future, uh, at the, the world will discover or, or invent a very efficient uh, renewable process or solar re uh, energy process that will give you uh, more energy per, per unit of, of sun ray of, or, or radiation. Then we can use total uh, renewable energy. That's no problem. Also, we have the option of the thermal cooling process. But again, there is a matter of space and cost. And we have an interesting question. With all these kissa related renewable energy projects, are you guys hiring engineers that have background in renewable energy engineering? Uh, usually, if, if we cannot do the project ourselves, uh, we're using contractors available in Kuwait, companies that, that uh, 
deal with the renewable energy uh, equipment and uh, this is how, how some of the projects are, are done. Yes, they have uh, some experience in, in the installation of uh, solar panels. Moving along to another KISSER related question. So what is the percentage of the role KISSER plays in the R&D of the RE applications? Now, uh, I don't know about the percentage, but what I want to say that uh, Tisser has re recently started uh, doing these renewable energy projects because uh, in the late 70s, uh, there was a policy that reversed our projects. We had uh, in the early 70s, the solar energy projects going on, but uh, the it was decided that we are an oil uh, producing country. We don't need renewable energy. So all this research have stopped until 2007, 2008. So our research is, is recent, uh, but uh, as long as research and R&D uh, is, is going, uh, we are, I think we in Kisser and Kuwait University are working, but in Kisser, I think we have more projects and more R&D uh, than Kuwait University, but also it's not a basic science R and D. It is applied applied science. Uh, I think after after uh, working on this, I, I mean I I mean by applied is that we're using an existing technology to test it in in Kuwait. This is mostly how we're doing it. But I think after we gain the experience in that field and the application of the existing technologies. We will we'll move a step further and work on the basic science. Yes. Is geothermal energy used to produce electricity? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Is geothermal energy used to produce electricity? I think it can it can be used, but mostly it is used for uh, heating uh, houses in the West. Yes. And all of these questions are amazing because it is a topic that everyone is interested in. Yes. But our final question for this evening is, as these RE harvests harvest require large spaces, will it pose a challenge for Kuwait with landscape boundaries? Uh, I don't think it will pose a, a challenge because uh, if you look at the map, the urban map of Kuwait, we're still living in 10% of the country. So maybe it will be a problem after 100 years, but not now. Now uh, we have lots of desert. And also these technologies can be building integrated, roof mounted. Uh, and we have many, many options. So uh, I, I don't think it will cause a problem. Even wind turbines, wind turbine, you can use them uh, offshore instead of onshore if, if you don't have land for that. So uh, for now, no, they, don't, they won't cause uh, a land issue. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussain, for your very thorough answers and keeping an open mind with all these questions. Um, thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed uh, the presentation and I've enjoyed the questions and uh, it's, it's great that people are interested in that field. It makes me happy. Uh, this is what the, uh, my presentation means today. I, I just wanted to spread the, the awareness of, of, of the different technologies that here we have something that we can use. Once again, thank you, Dr. Hussain. And for everyone joining us, please follow us on our social media outlets, ASCCKW on Instagram, and our website is ASCCKW.com. Thank you so much for joining us, and good night. Thank you very much. Good night.